Thank you so much. And it's really lo lovely to be here to talk about failure. Actually, I've never talked about failure before um, uh, explicitly, um, although we fail all the time, obviously. Let me just begin with a little bit of success, or at least how I began my career. I actually began here um, working with Howard Brenner, who probably not many people remember, but applied math uh, in chemical engineering and wrote a couple books early on, uh, which led me to meet uh, Bob Langer, um, who gave me a few papers uh, that reviewed inhaled insulin, which was a big thing back in the middle 1990s. We published an article that showed how you could deliver insulin uh, through the lungs, through wiffle ball-like particles that allowed you to use very simple inhalers. And that uh, we published in Science, and that led to a company which we sold really quickly in the late 90s. And so um, after that, I came and started to be teach at Harvard University. And the 9-11, uh, of course, happened. And then the anthrax scare, which some of you may remember. Because I had, in a way, weaponized uh, insulin, I was uh, brought to Washington to kind of figure out how to prevent people from weaponizing anthrax, and that led to an observation that if you put salt in the airways, you got rid of these little respiratory droplets that people at the time didn't really know what to think about those droplets, but we hear a lot about them now. And we published that in PNAS, and then I started a company, and I became funded by the Gates Foundation, and I was kind of at the most successful moment of my uh, career. Uh, on the other hand, I'm about to tell you about a big failure. And um, the, the reality was that um, I didn't feel so successful. And, and, and the reason is that, uh, well, I'm going to tell you about a moment uh, when I was in South Africa. We had started a not-for-profit in South Africa called MEND to bring uh, inhaled antibiotics uh, for TB and also an inhaled BCG um, vaccine um, for TB to, to a market, so to speak. I knew that that would never happen, actually. The markets really didn't exist in Africa for that. We were doing experiments in Africa on people for whom we really couldn't bring uh, products, and that seemed really wrong to me. I had done really well with my first company and then my second company, but it hadn't really led to um, the change that my papers promised that it would or that grants that I wrote um, or um, articles that were written about me. I really hadn't done any of that, and so I felt pretty false. And in that context, um, a friend of mine uh, who ran the, uh, the not-for-profit in uh, South Africa, in Pretoria, uh, put me in the car and said, I'm going to show you some of the villages that we um, sort of I thought we might uh, help, and I had just no clue of how people were living outside in the bush country in um, the northern um, uh, parts of South Africa. And I came across this scene, and it really uh, struck me. And I obviously took a picture. And uh, these uh, people were leaving um, trash in the, in, the, in the bush country. They didn't really look at us. It was clearly something that was just pretty commonly done. And it struck me in, for many, many reasons. Um, number one, those products that the packaging of which they were tossing into the uh, countryside looked like products like I might have kind of created. And they probably solved problems or at least um, uh, brought benefits to people that made them want to buy those. These people who invented these things probably did well. Um, there was a phenomenon going on in uh, Africa at the time where the infectious diseases that I had come thinking I might help um, uh, address were being accompanied by a lot of diseases that were sort of developed world diseases, cardiovascular disease and mental health issues, and diseases that were kind of brought on by products like the ones that were being tossed, um, the refuse uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the countryside. And so in a way, this was illustrative of what I felt I was doing with my career. I was bringing sort of a short-term benefit to some people, but in the long term, it was really the opposite. And uh, that really um, was very hard to, uh, to deal with. And so I kind of had a big existential moment. Now, I want to say about failure that um, once you leave school, of course, failure in school feels like the end. Uh, but once you leave school, failure is like your best teacher. Right, so the word teacher's not there. But if you're doing something new, and hopefully all of you will do something new, new when you leave, in fact, it's really hard today not to go off and do something new that nobody has quite done before. And if that's the case, then every step you take, there's always a good probability you're taking a wrong step. And um, actually, the wrong steps are the ones that teach you. The steps that kind of brought you where you thought you were supposed to be probably don't teach you anything. And so people who are pioneering tend to pay really close attention to failure. They do it a lot. They do it so much, they don't even think about it. And then these are all sort of catalyst learning. So that's not what I'm talking about right now. There, there's, there's kind of the big F word, OK? So this is a big failure. And that is like you've been 
pioneering and making little mistakes, but kind of climbing the hill. And then you realize like you're on the wrong hill. And there's something just, this is not the right place to be at all. And that can happen. Um, and that is, of course, just a big moment of questioning. And it was for me. And it led me to um, leave the United States. And uh, you know, my colleagues were, were really, really um, flexible at Harvard. And I went from 100% to a ha uh, 50% and then 25%. And I moved to Paris, and my wife is French, and uh, that, that worked for her, and, um, and why? So I, of course, the internet was kind of becoming a big thing back then. Most of you were like maybe not even born then, but at the time, it was really transforming the world. And what was happening with the internet was that suddenly people like me were creating with everybody else. And there was this big conversation going on, and it was leading to really surprising change, because everybody's talking about it, right? There's a big, this was kind of a co-creation. And uh, that wasn't happening in my material world, certainly not in my pharmaceutical healthcare world. And I wanted to create with other people. I felt like I could probably figure out what the problems were, but I don't, wasn't convinced that I or anybody really knew how to solve those problems in ways that were not regulated. In other words, way, ways that would be just kind of changing how people think and live. I didn't think I knew how to do that. And I was kind of not convinced anybody did. And so I needed to be in a conversation. And that felt to me like a cultural conversation. And so I opened a cultural center in Paris called the Laboratoire, where we did experiments with artists and designers at Frontiers of Science. And so we created new things. And uh, they were so kind of far out that they didn't seem very practical. And it was a pretty successful contemporary art and design space. And we created new works that ended up in museum collections and all of that. And we started some companies, some pretty far out companies, and they kind of grouped into two groups around edible packaging and uh, inhaled food. And uh, there were a couple really enlightened uh, VC firms here in the United States that invested, Polaris and Flagship, um, kind of took a big risk. These were very unusual kinds of things, and we kind of felt like we knew where these things were going. But the reality, we really didn't. And so we, I came back, and I opened the laboratoire not far from here at MIT. And so this is me, um, and this is what most pioneers do. Uh, but normally, you're doing it with your colleagues like, who've, who've like, climbed mountains. right? And so you're kind of budding with people who know what they're doing. And I was now in this place where like investors were doing things that we wouldn't, wouldn't normally do. And I was also with people. We're all kind of like doing this thing together. And so there's a lot of like double, 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 you know, multiplying my risk here. And uh, I was having fun. It was actually very really helpful to have Kirsty talk about her, um, her um, failing and, and having fun at it. Um, it was pretty fun, but it wasn't really uh, leading to what I had hoped. Um, it might not just be really concrete. What I had done over those years is I had been uh, exploring bringing health uh, to people through the air in non-regulated markets. And so uh, inhaled food and inhaled drinks and then digital scent. And, uh, and working with uh, really great designers and chefs who helped beautify the experimental process. I've become really convinced that in uh, engaging your audience with something that's really new, you need to sort of dignify that experience because there's no promise that that's going to bring a lot of benefit. And anyway, we learned a lot. And what happened was that the spring of, I, and I should mention this last um, object here, was a Nimbus, which was starting to get a lot of resonance in the food industry. And you could create, and we still do, you create uh, clouds of flavor over any drink, and it, you change it. So water with like raspberry is like raspberry water. Or if you have water with wine over it, it's wine. And, and even though you're just drinking water, your brain tells you you're drinking wine. And so you can play with the metabolism of, uh, of, uh, for various benefits, but it was still a pretty niche uh, concept. So, SARS-CoV-2 happens, and suddenly people are talking about respiratory droplets again. And now it's actually like in the New York Times, and so people like really are talking about it. And so I, with Bob Langer, um, approached the FDA, and Bob at one point was the head of the scientific advisory board. And so we spoke to Janet Woodcock, who leads the drug division, and we said that you know maybe uh, delivering these salts to the nose, you could get them right here. And, and I, it seemed to me that these respiratory drops might be right here, and you might be able to kind of clean these away and have a significant impact on the uh, COVID pandemic, and why would that matter? Well, what's interesting is when salts go through the nose, they're regulated in this country as um, cosmetics or as uh, cleansers, and uh, so you could, since there, uh, no, there's no drug here, you could get right into human testing, which we did, and uh, it, seemed, it worked, actually, and we did then many studies. Uh, we brought out a hacked product, uh, which had these salts, uh, hypertonic salts, uh, that, um, go right here into your larynx. 
and, um, and, and, and sold a lot here in the United States, but just continue to do studies. We have very little marketing. We're really trying to figure out really what's going on here and how important is this. And so we've done about eight human studies, uh, uh, and, and uh, many of them in India. So because of the pandemic and the severity of the pandemic and because of the kind of the primitive nature of a salt um, solution and the ability maybe to bring that to people everywhere, uh, it began to be used in India, and particularly in Bangalore. There was an amazing medical doctor who was doing trials, and um, the pandemic took a really bad turn in the spring, and, uh, and she then was uh, hospitalized while well, oxygen even later, but vaccinated her four of her uh, PCR lab technicians died, and so it was just a horrible thing. She decided, we're going to start a phase two trial. We're going to start treating people with this salt uh, solution, and did a phase two a random control uh, study with the nasal saline, and it turned out just in a few days, you eliminated symptoms, you pretty much eliminated rescue therapy, and you raised oxygen, which uh, was really surprising, actually, and so we've spent many months trying to figure it out, and uh, are just now publishing the results um, from a few continents of, uh, of clinical data. So we've learned a lot, and it generally what we've learned is that hydrating your upper airways is really critical to uh, lower respiratory tract disease, including COVID-19. And I say all of that to say that um, the um, kind of the eureka moment uh, which connects those two pictures from the field in Africa to this uh, hospital in Bangalore was this recognition that um, this sort of trajectory led to um, something that really uh, could uh, change, change lives. And, and I just came back from um, Switzerland. We met with the WHO and are preparing a process of trials in three regions in this developing world to uh, seek uh, WHO uh, support of a new uh, uh, hygiene intervention. Uh, that could go then to developing world countries, not in a form factor like this, but in a really industrial kind of, you know, uh, uh, very simple um, uh, means of uh, hydrating airways in, in uh, places that are not getting vaccinated. So this final form came out a week ago. Um, uh, seeing that this actually worked, um, I partnered with Robert Brunner, who was the lead designer at uh, Apple uh, years ago and did the Beats by Dr. Dre. And uh, it just came out, and, uh, and uh, we sold it out in 10 days. And so now, um, if you go to the website, it's, uh, we're kind of scaling up and everything like that. And so I say all of this to say that um, at my stage and at my age, um, failure is not just my teacher, it's my friend. Um, it's you know, done more for me than any success I've ever had. And uh, success actually feels very different than it did probably when I was most of your ages. Um, I kind of felt like success was mine when I was young. Um, at this point, um, success feels like a big uh, sort of confirmation about um, kind of how we all sort of work together. And, um, and so um, thank you very much, and uh, good luck. <laughs>